Netflix's new series The Watcher has plenty of people talking about the real-life unsolved mystery that inspired the show. The story, first reported by The Cut in 2018, follows the Broadus family, who shortly after moving into their new home, 657 Boulevard in Westfield, New Jersey, began to receive disturbing letters from an unknown stalker. The anonymous notes were signed by someone calling themselves The Watcher. They thanked the family for bringing young blood, their three small children, into the home. The Watcher included details on the new family and what they were doing at the house. They suggested they would be keeping tabs on the family and possibly worse. Once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them to me. Now whether you've already binge watched the entire show or you're dying to know more about the incredibly mysterious circumstances that occurred at 657 Boulevard, you've come to the right place. In this video, we'll share real life details that inspired this series. Before we get into the evidence and the list of suspects, let's first begin by looking at the first letter which ignited these series of events. It was June 2014 when someone mailed a letter to the new owners of 657 Boulevard. The house had not been listed for sale, yet within two days of the closing, the Watcher was aware that the Woods family had moved out and a new family was moving in. The Watcher knew details about the house, that it had six bedrooms and it was approaching its 110th birthday. The first note addressed to the new owner starts warmly welcoming the family to the home before taking a twisted turn. The letter reads, Dearest new neighbor at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood. How did you end up here? Did 657 Boulevard call to you with its force within? 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now. As it approaches its 110th birthday, I've been in charge for watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s, and my father watched in the 1960s. It is now my time. Do you know the history of this house? Do you know what lies within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. The writer also mentions watching the broadest family's three children. Do you need to fill the house with the young blood I requested? Better for me. Was your old house too small for the growing family? Or was it greed to bring me your children? Once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them to me. Who am I? There are hundreds and hundreds of cars that drive by 657 Boulevard each day. Maybe I am in one. Look at all the windows you can see from 657 Boulevard. The letter was signed by the watcher. Derek, the father who received the first letter, was terrified and quickly alerted the cops, who told him not to mention anything to the neighbors as they were all suspects. It was only two weeks after receiving the first letter that Derek's wife Maria found another one in the mail which detailed how the writer was watching. It reads, All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. Who am I? I am the Watcher, and I have been in control of 657 Boulevard for the better part of two decades now. Now what made this even more terrifying is the second letter referred to the family by name, even though it was misspelt, including three children and listed them by their birth order, which means whoever the Watcher was, they hadn't looked the family up, but must have been close enough to have heard them say it. During this time renovations were going on in the house causing the family to speculate that the watcher might have overheard them speaking to one of the contractors on the property. In the second letter the writer also mentions that they had noticed one of the children painting inside an enclosed porch which the family later told authorities was located in an area that was difficult to see unless the person was right next to the house. This is an interesting detail that will come up later in this video. The letter went on to ask if the children were too scared to play in the basement. It reads, I would be very afraid if I were them. It is far away from the rest of the house. If you were upstairs, you would never hear them scream. The watcher also asked which bedrooms the family would be sleeping in, saying it would help them plan better. After receiving the second letter, the family was under a ton of stress and this was taking a toll. Derek was experiencing depression while his wife Maria suffered from PTSD. As you can imagine, the entire family were living in constant paranoia. Now, let's look at the first suspect on our list. The Langfords, who lived next door since the 60s, which is when the watcher claimed the father watched the house, in his letter. In the house, Michael Langford, one of the prime suspects, along with his siblings, lived with his elderly mother, who was around 90 at the time. Michael was known to creep out new neighbors with his strange behaviors, like walking through their yards and, get this, peeking through their windows. Derek believed that Michael Langford had to be the culprit. The Langford home had a view of the enclosed porch where their daughter was painting, 
which was mentioned in the second letter. When he approached the cops about this theory, they told him that although he was a suspect, they needed hard evidence. As you can imagine, Derek was angry the cops couldn't do anything, and this is when he began taking matters into his own hands. He set up cameras and hired several private investigators. One of them, a former FBI agent, Robert Lenihan, uncovered some interesting details by studying the letter. He recognized old-fashioned ticks in the letters that pointed to an older writer, including double spaces between sentences and the fact that the letter had been addressed to M slash M Broadus in an old-fashioned form of writing an address. He also concluded that the lack of profanity meant the writer was likely less macho. And although Derek saw the Langfords as the prime suspect, private investigators found other leads. One night, around 11 p.m., cops surveilling the property saw a car suspiciously stop outside the house. They traced it to a young woman whose boyfriend lived nearby. She told investigators that her boyfriend was into some really dark video games, including one where he allegedly played as a character called The Watcher. The gamer then agreed to be questioned by police, yet hadn't shown up to the interviews, and with a lack of evidence, there was nothing they could do. Who else is on our list of suspects? While the house was undergoing renovations, one of the painters, Bill Woodward, noticed people living in a home behind the Broadduses, who had two chairs positioned suspiciously close to the house. Bill claims that one day he was looking out the window and saw an older guy sitting on one of the chairs facing the Broaddus family home. What about the horrific case of John Graff, who in the series received similar letters causing him to lose his mind, brutally murdering his entire family? Well, it's actually based on a true story, and the guy's real name is John List. He lived in Westfield, lost his job, and began spending $200,000 his mother had in savings before murdering his entire family on November 9, 1971. List went on the run and was captured 18 years later in 1989, after an episode of America's Most Wanted had aired on his crimes and was seen by around 22 million people. Up until that point, he had built a new life in the Virginia suburbs and even got remarried. List gave critical financial problems, as well as his perception that his family members were straying from their religious faith as his motivation for the murder. He believed that killing them would assure their souls a place in heaven, where he hoped to eventually join them. He died in prison in 2008 due to pneumonia at the age of 82. What makes this incredibly terrifying is that he managed to live among ordinary people undetected. It just goes to show, you never know who your neighbors are. Now, whether as depicted by the series, he received those letters from the Watcher, and that's what drove him insane, it's hard to tell, but it's unlikely. Which leads us to our next suspect. Well, you might find this one hard to believe, but it's none other than the Broaddus family themselves. Many theories began circulating in Westfield, the family was behind those letters. The logic is, they suffered buyer's remorse or realized they couldn't afford the home and had come up with some sort of scheme to get out of this sale or were even trying to get a movie deal. This is the hardest theory to believe, besides the psychological trauma they suffered, which was verified by a therapist and other sources who said the family was visibly distressed. A later investigation found another family in the neighborhood received a similar letter around the time the Broaddus family received the first letter. So if they were trying to get out of the home or get a movie deal, then writing a letter to another house doesn't make sense. It just doesn't add up. Derek said he believes the theories were spreading because it would ruin Westfield's reputation as a safe place to live. In June 2015, the family filed a legal complaint against the Woodses, the family they bought the home from, for failing to disclose that they had received a letter from the Watcher just before moving out. Finally, to their relief, the Broaddus family found a couple willing to rent the house from them, on the condition that a clause be included that would let them break the lease if another letter was sent to the house. Two weeks after they moved in, another letter arrived. It read, Violent winds and bitter cold to the violent, spiteful Derek and his wench of a wife, Maria. The Broadduses eventually sold the home in 2019 for a $400,000 loss, not including the agent's fee, the same one that sold them the house. So what is the latest evidence on the case? Well, in 2022, The Cut released a follow-up article detailing new findings that have surfaced since their original article was released. One recent theory which also appears in the series is that Robert Kaplow, a recently retired English teacher, was behind the letters. His former students said they frequently talked about writing letters to a house in his hometown, an exercise in the series known as an ode to a house. Kaplow denied involvement and said he wrote to different homes in Westfield, admiring, not threatening. 
While the watcher still has not been identified, the police now believe that the culprit is an older female who lives near 657 Boulevard. After the original article was released, the Union County Prosecutor's Office approached those who lived near the house for saliva samples to DNA test against the envelopes. Two neighbors denied giving a sample. At least one of them who refused was a close neighbor of 657 Boulevard and someone the police had considered a prime suspect. At this point, the case remains unsolved and there seems to be only two possibilities of us ever finding out who the Watcher really is. A confession from the Watcher or a DNA match. Who do you think the Watcher is? Did we miss anything? Let us know your theory in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.